Hello and welcome to the next lecture in the course on introduction to computer and network performance analysis using queuing systems. I am Professor Varsha Apte and I am a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. So, uh, we will continue our uh, study of closed queuing networks and we will study a very important method called mean value analysis. Um, so, just to recall quickly uh, what we have done in the last few lectures, we have done closed queuing networks with just a single server and uh, we, we did a lot of analysis on this, uh, we figured out how to calculate the, how to relate the throughput and the response time, we did some asymptotic analysis and we also saw some examples. So, uh, the, the main thing there difference from the open queuing networks was that the load, uh, the way the load on the network is shown is by number of uh, clients and mean think time rather than an arrival rate. And remember that we were not really bothering about a limited buffer size, we are always assuming that the buffer sizes at the server are larger than the number of requests or the clients that are there in the system. So, we also do not consider this. So, continuing this theme just like in the case of open queuing systems, uh, from open queuing systems we went to open queuing networks, uh, the same uh, motivation remains for closed systems to go from closed systems with a single node to closed systems with multiple uh, stations or nodes. Um, for example, just like in the previous in a single simple uh, closed queuing system we have clients. Uh, we will have um, say a, a set of users that are interacting with the server system, but this time the server system may not have just one uh, server station. Uh, we may have something like a web application which is two tier, a two tier web application. So, this could be the web server and this could be the DB server. And um, so, a request that comes to this uh, two tier web application may have some flow like it has to do some work at the web server, then there is a database call. So, there is some processing at the database server, then uh, whenever there is a database server processing it actually always just has to come back to the web server right, we always have to come back to the web server. Um, then uh, this may happen a few times and with some probability p uh, the at some point of time of course, the web uh, server processing of the request will finish and then it will go back uh, in the form of an HTML page to the user. And then the user will think and then issue the next request right. So, this cycle will continue except now you have uh, more servers at the uh, at the server end, you do not have just one web one server, you have multiple server sta servers which we say which we call either a server station or node. Uh, what that uh, implies is that the number of requests flowing through the system. Uh, is always going to be fixed. So, there could be n 1 requests at the web server uh, waiting in the queue and waiting for their process processing, there could be n 2 requests at the DB server in the queue are getting processed. And if this we know n 1 and n 2 then we will know that m minus n 1 minus n 2 requests are thinking. Meaning. Uh, they are back at the user and the users are thinking or reading the response and waiting basically at the end of that they will issue the next request. So, this is a, a very important thing that the number of requests circulating in the system will remain uh, fixed and that is why precisely we call these queuing networks as closed queuing networks. So, this is one example under which closed queuing networks uh, arise and clo closed queuing networks make sense. As I had said previously also such a model makes sense if m is small. So, if it is a lab of uh, where there are 100 students and those 100 students are interacting with some course management system, uh, that is one example uh, of a small set of users. We go with open queuing networks when m is large and think time is also large. Then one can show that uh, we can uh, uh, you know uh, rather uh, model it as open queuing systems with Poisson arrivals let us say and this ends up being actually uh, a fair uh, model ok. So, uh, this is one example under which closed queuing networks arise, let us see the second example. 
So again imagine it is the same uh, web server kind of system, but for the moment let us imagine there is just a web server okay, at the server end and this whole thing let us suppose that this whole thing is the server machine. Okay. And now in this picture we are not modeling the end users that are sending requests to this machine. Uh, the scenario is uh, we are uh, uh, looking at a, sy uh, a system in which there is a fixed number of server threads. So let us say this web server is configured with 128 threads that is a very typical number that a web server is uh, configured with and those threads are going to be in this machine uh, using a little bit of CPU. Uh, they will have a CPU burst and once the CPU, they may they will very uh, uh, commonly need some IO they might read something from a file. So, they are they will uh, issue the IO call and then go into IO wait mode and they will queue uh, for some for their IO request to be fulfilled right. So, these are these threads uh, this picture here represents the, the uh, queuing system of the threads with, with the web requests. Okay. So, all of this is inside the machine, this is the thread that th you can say this is the thread pool, this is the buffer uh, of the web requests. So, whatever web requests come externally from the users are queuing here and there is a thread pool and the thread pool picks up the request here and then does a CPU IO cycle and then finishes again with probability P and then and then uh, goes back to the thread pool to see whether there is any other request waiting to be picked up. Once it is sees that there is a request in the queue it will pick up come back here and then this cycle will continue. Okay. So, this is a typical uh, server cycle right. Now imagine what happens at high load okay. let us just focus on what happens at high load very high load. What do I mean by high load? There are a lot of users and uh, they are issuing requests very frequently. So, the rate of arrivals into this system this is high okay this is so high that we assume that uh, this queue is never going to be empty this request queue here is never going to be empty there is going to be always some request here waiting to be served and these 128 threads are always busy Okay. So, what are we assuming? We are assuming that the web server threads are always going to be busy as soon as they finish fulfilling one request there is going to be something in the queue here for the thread to pick up and then the thread will come back into the system. So, what are we saying here? Suppose a thread let me just change the color okay. this is at high load. So, uh, there is a thread that picks up this request and uh, immediately enters the first thing a request uh, is always going a thread is always going to need is the CPU. So, it will come to the CPU uh, it will go to the IO and as usual it will it will circulate many times and when it is done what is going to happen is uh, it, there is going to be a next request there is going to be a next request sitting here. Okay. And uh, to pick up a request it does not take much time and uh, in it will just pick up the next request here because it is going to be waiting there and it will again enter the system and again do the same cycle okay, of CPU IO and then exit here. Uh, a key uh, assumption to note here is we are going to assume that all these if we assume actually if we assume that all these requests are statistically similar. Okay. That means they have the same uh, mean service time, the same uh, branching probability P of finishing, they have the same um, uh, variance and, and everything. Uh, their service time distribution is basically the same and their probability of uh, wanting the IO versus going finishing uh, after this uh, getting the CPU is the same. Then it is as if the same request has come back into the system, right. It is as if the request has returned into the system right. So, uh, this is what uh, what we assume we actually remove this uh, the representation of that uh, node of the thread pool queuing system uh, 
and we just think of this as a uh, queuing uh, closed queuing network where there are threads like these 128 threads are forever circulating between the CPU and IO and even when the branch this of this probability P is taken of finishing it just directly comes back into the CPU queue ok. This branch will actually represent completion of a request. But we do not go back uh, put the thread back into the thread pool and then pick up the next request we kind of ignore all of that we say that it take that time will be negligible and it is as if the same thread has just come back uh, into the CPU ok. And this is uh, this makes sense because the time to pick up a request is going to be negligible and the next request that the thread works on is statistically similar. So, it does not matter it is going to have the same tau 1 here it is going to have the same tau 2 here and uh, so it does not really matter. So, these are the two scenarios under which closed queuing networks are, uh, are modeled. So, these are the typical parameters of the closed queuing networks. Uh, M is the number of clients uh, if there is a client node ok, this is not always there. Not always present. But um, in, in uh, if you are modeling the users explicitly then it is present otherwise it would be the kind of a closed queue network where you are just going through this uh, you know without modeling this explicitly. Um, then there is the if there is a client node then there is a think time ok. If there is a client node then there is a think time and as usual we have number of uh, queuing stations n for example here n is equal to 3. Uh, we have the uh, average service time per visit tau i. Uh, mu i is nothing but 1 over tau i, closed queuing networks can be defined with multiple servers here right, we can have multiple servers here itself at each node. So, C i represents the number of servers at station i, um, then we have this thing called V i which is the same uh, similar to the visit count at uh, for open queuing networks with a very big difference that in case of closed queuing networks visit counts are relative and I will explain this a little bit more later. But what V i denotes in case of closed queuing networks is the average number of visits to some to a station i relative to visits to some station j ok. I will explain this in the next few slides. Uh, but once we have an average relative uh, uh, average visit count uh, then we can de define service demand the same way that it was defined for open queuing networks. So, what is this relative visit counts ok. Uh, since there is no notion of exit from a closed queuing network right, this is requests are just going to circulate in this uh, in this uh, inside this queuing network actually they just are circulating here you know and if, if you draw the boundary around the queuing network they are never going to leave and this also it is the same this is a closed system and things are just uh, revolving here they are uh, circulating within this system. So, there is no exit. So, if there is no exit how can we define an expected number of visits until exit right that is what uh, uh, visit count was in the open queuing network it was the expected number of visits to a station i uh, uh, from the point that a request enters to the point that it leaves. So, it is difficult to define this for a closed queuing network. What we do instead is we as I said before we uh, talk about the number of visits made to server SI relative to the number of visits made to some server SJ. Now, what is this SJ going to be? Which server do we do this relative to? In some queuing networks that is going to be very obvious. So, for example, queuing networks with an explicit client node it is going to be uh, uh, very uh, it is going to be very intuitive ok. This is the one with the explicit client node and this is the one the, the CPU IO kind of uh, situation ok. So, let us take the explicit client node first. So, in this example uh, it is kind of intuitive actually the relative visit counts uh, seems like an unnecessary word actually. It is kind of intuitive that you are going to be that this is the entry and this is the exit at least from the server part of the network right 
So, we are calling it closed if we include the clients also in this, but there is a very clear notion and, and there is a very clear boundary in some sense of entering the server side and leaving the server side. Okay. So, for, for uh, keeping the notion of the relative visit counts, we can simply say that it is V1 is the number of visits made to S1 relative to one visit to client node. Right? So, we just make it relative to one visit to client node and then everything uh, falls into place even V2 is the number of visits made to server S2 relative to one visit per one visit. So, when you exit from here and make an entry here, you are making one visit to the client node and so it, it all becomes intuitive for the explicit client node. For the CPU IO fixed threads example, it is not so straightforward because there is no client node. So now what can we say average number of visits uh, is to be uh, strictly theoretically the number of visits that a request makes to CPU is actually infinite right there is nothing uh, that is you, you know the notion of actually a request finishing we have kind of uh, forgotten and we are we are making this request just circulate through the CPU and IO forever there is no uh, explicit notion that now this request is done and going back to the client node. right? However, uh, we know that this uh, branch is actually the uh, it is actually an exit. right? We know that this is actually an exit and there was a, a thread pool and uh, all that system here that we chose not to model but we know that this is the exit. So, we can knowing this thing we can calculate the uh, average number of visits here uh, knowing that this was the exit and this was the entry. Okay. Um, and this can be done using uh, some mathematical setup that we will see when we do some examples. Uh, just as a, a peep into that uh, we can calculate actually based on the structure of the queuing network here that uh, VCPU is actually going to be 1 by P. Okay. So, we can use this 1 by P as a given uh, and then we calculate VIO with respect to VCPU. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we can also just uh, start with some given VCPU and some given VIO and uh, we can assume that this has been measured in the system directly and in fact that is what we are going to do uh, in the rest of the analysis here. We are going to assume that uh, VCPU and VIO is just given to us. Uh, the only thing that I wanted to point out that neither this nor neither VCPU nor VIO are kind of going to be one. There is going to be no node here uh, relative to which the other visits are calculated. They are both uh, going to be more than one. Okay. Uh, so, relative visit counts here are to be interpreted as average number of visits a thread makes to CPU or IO after starting a fresh request and up to finishing it and we expect to just get these numbers um, as parameters to our closed queuing network. Okay. So, with this definition let us uh, define some metrics. The metrics are actually again not uh, very different from uh, open queuing networks and then the closed queuing system with the single server. If you just think of these two, uh, the metrics will come together in your mind very easily. Um, so, system throughput, we start with system throughput for the explicit client node, it is easy, it is the throughput across this arc. Okay. Uh, in the uh, fixed uh, thread CPU IO kind of model again we know that this was actually the exit. So, it will be throughput across this arc. Uh, system response time uh, in case of uh, the uh, explicit client node it is it's much easier it is basically going to be uh, response time at node uh, server 1 uh, plus response time at server 2. Uh, in case of um, uh, the fixed IO threads uh, it is it is also going to be similar it is response time here and plus response time at IO. Uh, but uh, it is a little trickier notion again we have to base that uh, remembering that this was actually an exit. Okay. So, the system response time is the time from which you join here uh, and then uh, you may circulate here and then leave here. So, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, so let us come to cycle time. Cycle time 
uh, will again have a more clear definition where there is an explicit client node, it is system response time plus think time. In the case where there is no explicit client node actually think time does not exist and we can just say that uh, is 0 if no client node. And here system response time and cycle time is the same thing. Uh, then again we have the individual throughputs of the stations, this is lambda 1 here, this is lambda 2 here and same thing here this is uh, you can say lambda CPU, this is lambda IO. Uh, then we have uh, the server utilizations as usual, we have response times at each server yeah, uh, waiting time at each uh, node uh, and uh, response time at each node, number of customers queue length at each node, these are the same as the open queuing networks. Now we have metrics similar to the closed system, remember there was a saturation number which was how many users does this uh, system support um, and this again exists, this, this time we just have to ma make sure that we take into account the capacities of both the servers. Um, and just like open queuing networks we have a notion of a bottleneck server ok. M star here the saturation number over here uh, is going to be uh, the maximum number of requests such that one of these nodes shows full utilization um, and M star is actually uh, clearly defined for uh, queuing networks with explicit client node. Yeah, so uh, these are the two kinds we always have to remember that one of these does not have a client node. So anything, any metric or calculation that has to do with think time does not apply to this queuing network. Okay. Um, further uh, there is a kind of uh, queuing network which is the Jackson queuing network. This is again very similar to the open Jackson queuing networks, uh, the assumptions required are almost the same. A closed queuing network is a Jackson queuing network, if the branching is memoryless, this uh, uh, branching of going back here versus here or any other kind of branching that might be there in the queuing network, memoryless means uh, no matter how many times you are coming out of the CPU, the server 1 uh, uh, service, the probability that you will finish versus the probability that you have to go to server 2 remains the same. Okay, remember that is what is memoryless that you, uh, you you cannot say that after 3 visits to the server S1 probability of finishing is high that does not uh, meet the memoryless assumption. Uh, service times have to be exponentially distributed, think time has, exponent, has to be uh, exponentially distributed and scheduling discipline has to be FCFS. Okay. In that case um, it is a closed Jackson queuing network and we can uh, apply uh, some theorems and some laws which make analysis much easier. So it is closed Jackson queuing networks for which analysis is possible. So uh, let us start going over some results uh, that are uh, applicable only for Jackson networks and these are the results and theorems again that make uh, analysis uh, just uh, very elegant. Okay. So uh, to some extent this Sevchik Mitrani arrival theorem uh, it is uh, it is not similar but it serves the same purpose as pasta for us, remember pasta in open queuing networks or open queuing systems. Okay. Because of pasta and some other properties of Poisson arrivals, okay. properties of Poisson arrivals. in open queuing systems. Okay. Because of these uh, analysis became easy, uh, you should go back and refer to those lectures that it, uh, analysis becomes uh, much easier uh, with this. Uh, that similar purpose is served by the Sivchek Mitrani arrival theorem. Okay. Let me uh, just go over what it is. Okay. For a closed Jackson queuing network with a load level. So sometimes by the way we say load level for this number of clients or number of requests because it is an indicator of a load in the system. So uh, with a load level of uh, M a request arriving at node I sees the probability distribution of the length of the queue at node I uh, 
uh, as if the queuing network has one less customer in the system. Okay. In other words, it sees the state of the system as if it itself is not there in the system, but just observing the system. Okay. So, uh, uh, I, I will actually make this a little more formal and then I will give an example. So, uh, let n i m be the unconditional steady state time average of number of customers at node i. Okay. Now, I think everybody remembers this time average, steady state, unconditional, we have talked about these things uh, very often. Unconditional means it is not at any particular time, it is just over any period of time and it is a time average meaning that it takes into account how long a certain number of customers uh, were there in that system and steady state means uh, warm up effects of the in the system are ignored. We are uh, looking at the system when the system is, is at a, a statistical equilibrium. Okay. All of these uh, things we have talked about before, so please go back and uh, refer to those. Uh, so, let n i m, so n uh, i is the, is the index of the node, m is the load level, this is how we uh, express every metric in a, in a uh, closed queuing network. Uh, at load level m, the steady state time average of the number of customers at node i is denoted by n i m. Okay. As opposed to that, let n superscript a and subscript i m be the average number of customers at node i as seen by an arriving request. Again, uh, please go back and uh, look at the lectures which are talking about how unconditional averages are different from what is seen at uh, arrival arrivals okay, or at seen at any other uh, points also even the averages seen at departures will be different or if it is conditioned on any other other event uh, then it is uh, different okay. those uh, those uh, averages are not always the same. Okay. We had in talked about this in the uh, context of pasta. So, you can go back and look at the lectures on pasta uh, these two averages uh, need not always be the same. Okay. So, what does Savchik Mitrani theorem say okay, about uh, remember about seeing the system as if one less customer. Okay. Mathematically that means that uh, what a request sees at a node i at arrival moment uh, arrival times for a uh, queuing network which has m customers in the system. Uh, it is the same as the unconditional average. Remember, I am not putting the superscript here. So, this is the unconditional average with one less customer in the system at the m minus 1 level. Okay. So, it is as if uh, the request which is arriving to this node i is not there in the system. Okay. So, it, it is as if it is just an observer and if it was an observer and observed the unconditional averages at each node, then that is what it would see at the points that it arrives into the network even when it is actually in the network right we are operating at the load level m but the arriving request sees the system as if it is not there okay it's an absolutely beautiful thought uh, please think about it it might take some time to uh, digest this thought okay so i'm just going to give an example uh, with some numbers uh, so imagine that m is equal to 10 okay and there are uh, there are say 6 customers uh, thinking right now that uh, that and imagine so 4 should be somewhere at these servers. So, uh, let us say there is there are 3 requests queued here and 1 request in service here. Um, so, the uh, the steady state average averages will be denoted by n 1 10 right. So, this is uh, at server 1 and n 2 10 this is the average at server 2. Okay. This is what the average is currently in this system. Okay. Uh, when one of these requests is issued and it arrives at that point, uh, the average that it will see at this node is actually n 1 9. Okay. Is it as if this request is not there in the system? Okay. Similarly, when it arrives here also, the average that it will see is n 2 9 as if there are total 9 customers in the system. So, this is something that allows us a very very elegant way to analyze queuing uh, uh, closed queuing networks and uh, that is what we will look at 
in the next lecture. We will be doing a method called mean value analysis which uses Sevchik Mitrani theorem to analyze and get all the steady state metrics of uh, closed Jackson queuing networks. Thank you.